Hello, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Sylvie Kaufmann. Uh, I'm French, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> nobody's, per nobody's perfect. Uh, no. I'm a journalist, I'm afraid. Um, and I'm a columnist uh, at Le Monde and also uh, from time to time at the New York Times, just to show you that some French people do speak English. <laughs> we are actually doing better now. Um, and uh, so we're here to talk about. Euroscepticism and Europe. Um, and I think it's a fantastic uh, issue. Actually, I have to say that I'm extremely happy to be in Bratislava because I was here uh, for the first time a long, long time ago when it was still Czechoslovakia. <laughs> and I, I came back when it was Slovakia, but I haven't been here for a long time and I always loved this place. And I always had uh, very interesting uh, uh, talks and interviews here. So it's a, it's a real pleasure personally to be here uh, tonight and, um, and to talk about Europe, um, which is something I'm quite uh, passionate about. Um, so we, somebody earlier told me that this part of Europe joined the European Union in 2004 and the big crisis started in 2008 so you only had four years of happiness in fact in, <laughs> in uh, Europe and since then it's so always been crisis after crisis. Now one thing you may not know is that those of us who have been uh, in the European Union longer or even founding members uh, which is the case for France, or and joined us uh, earlier than you did, like Austria in 1995, the, we know that you, the European Union only moves forward through crisis. That's, that's the fun of it. You know? <laughs> uh, and in fact, it's painful, those crises are painful, but usually we um, live stronger, like like uh, in eventually that's what happened during the euro crisis we we were on the verge of you know i remember including in my newspaper the headlines that we were on the verge of um, breaking the eurozone or that the euro was threatened you know the very existence of the euro was threatened and um, and you know it didn't happen um so now we are being tested again. It's, it's a very difficult time, uh, again, not only for the European Union, for the whole uh, international community, for the transatlantic alliance, as we see. Um, and, um, you know, for, I guess, for citizens, for European citizens and for voters, and including for uh, people in this country, uh, it must be really difficult to to cope with this. Uh, uh, we call this in French les, les montagnes russes. You know this uh, roller coaster. Um, it's Russian mountains in France. I don't know. <laughs> um, so we have this. We've had this populist wave, which actually ori originated uh, in Western Europe in my country, notably, with the National Front, Marine Le Pen, and then, you know, in the Netherlands, and uh, in Austria, and uh, in the UK. Um, and then it moved to Central Europe, and I think now it's coming back to the West. It's quite interesting. So anyway, uh, I think we have a lot to talk about uh, this evening um, in terms of what feeds uh, Euroscepticism and, and how to how to fight it. Uh, so we have three very good speakers to address this issue. First, we have uh, 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 State Secretary Ivan Korczok. Uh, you were ambassador of um, Slovakia in Brussels, right, for several years. So you know uh, very well uh, the European Union and its uh, 
ups and downs. Uh, we have um, the Vice President of the European Commission, uh, Maros Shevchovic, who is, uh, whose plane is, uh, was late, so he'll be here shortly, I think in about 15 minutes. He's on his way from Vienna. Um, and we have Paul Schmidt from Austria, who also was posted in Brussels at some, what, which years were there? Two thousand six to two thousand nine. Okay, so that's uh, at the same time as you, right? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you when were we after two thousand nine. Two thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. You were in Germany that. before I that. Yeah. Germany, right. 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 This is a different place. Yes. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Paul Schmidt is the general secretary of the Austrian Society for European Policy, uh, and knows uh, very well the public opinion of our countries. So I will start with you, uh, State Secretary. Um, talking about Euroscepticism, is there a specificity uh, of, of uh, Euroscepticism in this part of Europe? Is there a Visegrad <laughs> Euroscepticism? Uh, uh, is it different from uh, Euroscepticism in Western Europe? Thank you, uh, Madame Kaufmann, dear Sylvie. I, before I try to give you an answer, I want to say that I am Slovak and I am not afraid. Are you happy? Yes. And two, why is it that you French always tend to believe that your English is not good? <laughs> First, your English is very good and I can tell you English of your president is very good. Absolutely. Uh, because we have met him just two hours ago. Uh -huh. I yeah, had the privilege Sofia, to... Yeah, you just flew from Sofia, yeah, yeah, right. Two yeah. hours ago yeah. we finished our meeting with uh -huh. President Macron. And he not, not only speaks very well English, or very good English, but it's uh, very inspiring, uh -huh. uh, I can tell you. And his commitment and his resolve and determination to move the European Union forward is impressive uh -huh. and uh, is a source of inspiration. That does not mean that we agree with everything what he is proposing, not at all. But indeed, uh, in my view, he is the one at this moment who, who has um, ambition mm -hmm. to really move the whole project forward because we cannot uh, stay where we are at this moment, otherwise we will see other uh, crises coming. But back to your Back to your question. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back we to Macron later. Oh, so yes, yeah. okay. <laughs> that was not my intention at all, but, you know, uh, I'm still somehow with my mind yeah. there. Uh, but uh, whether there is a specificity uh, about or in connection with uh, Euroscepticism in Central Europe, first, my very, very short answer would be I don't think we can speak about Euroscepticism, as we know it in general terms, in Central Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, reasoning for that is that if you simply look at the figures uh, and public opinion polls are showing clearly that in Visegrad countries, and of course it varies between Czech Republic and the rest, for example, but we see still a solid majority of, of our citizens supporting European Union. So therefore, I don't think that we can that we can just generalize and say that because of, let's say, two dominant um, issues that are at the table right now, which uh, can create impression as if there would be Euroscepticism, I don't think we can accept it. And the two predominant issues which determine the picture of Central Europe, let's say from the Western European uh, uh, parts, is at this moment, in my view, let's say the focus on rule of law in Poland and Hungary, mm -hmm. and two, a very firm stance that the four countries, Visegrad countries, have taken during the migration crisis. Mm -hmm. And here I think, and I'm very critical, vis-a-vis uh, -vis those who say that uh, because of our a uh, strong position on migration and against uh, mandatory quota. And because of current collision over rule of law, we can say that we are not good Europeans. Uh, 
and we can work more on this if if, mm -hmm. if you wish so because I don't want to uh, have a too long um, answer to this and second or third um, in f uh, and you made that point already Sylvie that we joined 2004 mm -hmm. on a promise I remember that that our citizens are uh, becoming members of something that w has been portrayed as a synonymous of or synonym of stability, of prosperity, mm -hmm. of, a, of a power. Mm -hmm. But the picture or the perception mm -hmm. that we could uh, receive over the years since we joined was completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, because not only the crisis started uh, uh, in 2008 and nine. <laughs> but remember what President Chirac said, I think, uh, shortly before we joined. You missed the opportunity to shut up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that I, I, un unfor unfortunately, I remember a lot uh, already. Mm -hmm. So, I, I make the long story short, in spite of, in spite of the picture that we have um, gathered uh, during the 14 years of our membership, I'm proud that still our citizens uh, so massively, mm -hmm. I can say, support its membership of European Union. That does not mean that there are not people who criticize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there would not be criticism, I think that would be surreal world. But the point is, once again, I don't think we can speak of, uh, of Euroscepticism mm -hmm. generally in, in Central Europe. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I finished my introductory <laughs> remarks, <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Vice President. Yeah, you arrived just... Uh, Welcome, <laughs> welcome. You. Yeah, we we already uh, said why you were you would be a bit late because of the plane, right? So um, we just started to talk about um, the reasons uh, and the specificity, maybe, of Euroscepticism in uh, in this region compared to to uh, Western Europe. Um, you mentioned this <laughs> remark of uh, President Chirac, and it's true that, in fact, I was saying you had, you had four years of happiness, but in fact, in 2004, it was already tragic because there was this division about uh, Iraq, the Iraq war. So um, it was not that happy right from the beginning. Well, it, 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 we were not happy to hear it. Uh, that, that's mm. true. But, uh, but you were happy to join. Oh, absolutely. Yes. We, we are ha happy to join because one thing that nobody, I think, can, can deny, refuse, or we cannot forget that whatever you see in Central Europe, the, our membership and the whole integration of our countries or those who joined in 2000 is a success story. Mm -hmm. I keep on telling that our people, if you travel outside of Bratislava, mm -hmm. outside of Budapest and, and Warsaw, everywhere, Everywhere you can not only see, but you can touch how much these countries have changed. And I dare say, what would there, what would there be if there had not been our membership in, in European Union? So I, I think we, we need to stress that the membership uh, of, for us has been a source of, uh, of modernization mm -hmm. of, our, of our countries. And the fact that there are critical voices coming from Central Europe, the fact that Poles and Hungarians are in discussion about rule of law, I think this is part of a life mm -hmm. uh, that would not be normal if we would not have this type of problem. Uh, we don't have anybody here in Central Europe like you have it with Marine Le Pen. Mm -hmm. And therefore I, I say, you know, those who, who say in Central Europe, <laughs> or do we, some of the countries you even have them in government. Yes, <laughs> well, that's, that's the way we, we see it also. Excuse me, but <laughs> they told me to be provocative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I apologize. No, but, but, but remind me now, where, where, where is in the, in the government? Somebody like Marine Le Pen here? I mean, there, there's probably no one like Marine Le Pen anywhere. Well, that was my point. But if you look to, close, if, yeah, if you look uh, to the, 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 the political discourse which we hear from Hungary, for example, that can be quite, well, I, quite radical. I know well, you w don't want to comment on this, but <laughs> no, let me comment on no, this. <laughs> but you are pushing me in a position that I should now defend Hungary. So I'm, I'm, Slovak, I'm Slovak diplomat. Then I we change the topic. <laughs> I, but, but okay, I, yeah. I, I'll stop here, but yeah. I, I tell you also mm -hmm. one thing. Recently, when I was again confronted with a situation about commitment to rule of law here in Central Europe, which I don't deny that there are problems mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. but I find it a bit strange that just a year 
uh, or year and a half, when Europe was shivering, you know, mm -hmm. when you, mm -hmm. Europe was afraid of what would be the outcome of elections sure. in Austria, in France, in, France, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, uh, in Italy we had one, and all of a sudden, as if everything is fine, imagine if there would be, you know, mm -hmm. other outcome of elections in Western Europe. I don't think we would, mm -hmm. by if that would have been the case, I don't think we would be that much focused on Central Europe. This is not an apology, but I'm just reminding yeah. us to have a bit more complex view of, of this. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Shevchovic, um, on this topic, um, when, when there was the enlargement of 2004, these uh, ten, 10 new member states, we were um, supposed to all converge and become, you know, uh, there was a path which looked quite uh, uh, shiny, <laughs> designed for, and that we would all take this path peacefully. And Hubert uh, uh, Vidrin, the, the former French uh, foreign minister, says we were all supposed to become Swedish social democrats. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, what happened? <laughs> No, we are Slovak Slovaks. <laughs> 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 no, what, what, what went wrong? Why, why aren't we all, uh, not only in this part of Europe, but also in Western Europe, not all Swedish Social Democrats? Yeah. At first, I, I have to say good evening, and, it, and I enjoyed the debate. So I was kind <laughs> of watching, you know, and I really, <laughs> and I really like it. But thank you for, uh, for bring, uh, bringing me in. But I would say... Uh, a couple of points when we are discussing Euroscepticism. So I was actually looking what was the origin of the name. And what was quite interesting when you're talking about social democrats, uh, that for the, for the first time the Euroscepticism as a word was used actually by British Times describing the situation in the Labour Party in 1984. Uh -huh. Then of course with, uh, when uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, became the Prime Minister, the Euroscepticism got a little bit different <laughs> flavour. But fast forwarding to uh, 2004, I totally agree with uh, Ivan that for us it was, uh, I would say, historic milestone. I mean, we as a Slovaks felt that uh, finally we are becoming equal member of the, of the European family. And, uh, you know, in uh, this part uh, of the world, we not always had the easiest of uh, history. So, so far as it was an uh, enormous uh, feeling of accomplishment, of hope and uh, of um, enthusiasm for the future. And I think that that was also the, the, f the, the feeling across uh, the Europe. And I think that if you are looking at uh, today's situation, and if you really want to be honest, you have to say that both sides, old member states and new member states, we're not quite ready for this big enlargement. Because uh, you've been describing the, the, the trauma of uh, Iraq war. I can tell you that for me, uh, the even bigger trauma was the discussion on uh, constitutional treaty or uh, Constitution Européenne at that time, and in particular, I have to say in France, because, and it was not only Polish plumber, but I would say the billboards totally degrading Slovak girls, it was just absolutely amazing. And uh, to somehow blame all the ills of um, the situation in uh, Western Europe at that time on the, on the, on the new <laughs> member states, who've been just members really, I would say, just few few months, it was really unfair, and, and, and I think it, it just revealed that we both um, needed maybe a little bit uh, uh, better uh, preparation. Even now you have uh, sometimes the, the, the situation in Western Europe which uh, um, uh, a colleague of mine is, uh, is describing as uh, vestalgia how nice it would be to go back to the, the small 12 member state rich no, Europe. Six. But simply we have to realize that that train has left the station and uh, we have to really cooperate uh, in completely uh, new and honest way as, as, a, as a Europeans because uh, yesterday uh, we had very difficult debate in the college and then we had uh, a very impressive uh, meeting with the Secretary General and what we discussed was actually the crisis of the West. Uh, nobody would believe that today uh, we would be discussing <laughs> the, uh, I would say, the, the current state of affairs where uh, United States are, are ready to impose the transactions uh, uh, upon us on the basis of security threat. That uh, they are ready to um, um, uh, threat with arrests of the, 
of the managers of the companies uh, who just simply sign the contracts in accordance with the international law and UN resolution and they, they started the project in Iran? And do we believe that uh, as a, I would say, Hungarian, Slovaks, uh, 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 and uh, smaller Western European countries, we can really compete in this globalized world with China, with the United States, uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia. So simply, this is, I think, what uh, somehow pushes us that if you want to manage well mm -hmm. in, in this century, I think we should uh, uh, simply um, try to realize that our destiny is really a common and uh, uh, that maybe this, uh, the, the start was not the easiest and that we go through the rough patch right now and nobody, uh, I think, can... Uh, be surprised by that because we went through, through such a poly crisis like none of the uh, post-war uh, generation had to. We had economic crisis, banking crisis, migration crisis, terrorism crisis, you name it. Mm -hmm. But I think that was the s so far, I would say, the, the, the most difficult test that Europe had to go through and, and we managed to go. So therefore, despite of all the discussion, I am I'm, um, optimistic that uh, we, we understand Europeans and, uh, and uh, the lessons of Brexit, lessons of uh, our current state of affairs with the United States, all the tensions we have uh, around our borders is somehow giving us the lesson that, I mean, our destiny is to, to, uh, to work together. To conclude my <laughs> a little bit longer answer to your question, I would say that um, I heard from uh, one head of state, and I have to say that it's a uh, head of state from, uh, from Eastern Europe, when he was asked about uh, democracy, rule of law, courts, corruption, and, and all this uh, uh, unfortunate phenomenon we, we are going through in our parts of Europe, he, he said, look, but uh, I believe in democracy, and democracy is not always linear. You have ups, you have downs, mm -hmm. but what is very important to keep it in that frame, keep it on the basis of uh, democratic values and making sure that we would keep it in that, in that, in that corridor. And therefore, I think we have, uh, as, as a commission, such a tense corridor discussions with Poland, with, with Hungary, because we really believe that it's our duty as a, as a European institution to keep it in that democratic uh, corridor. corridor. And, and uh, this is what I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very important. And um, I think that engagement, I know that we have young leaders of Globsec here, it's very important that uh, the young people are interested. I'm very glad that they are and uh, uh, that they would, they would carry on on, on the message. Thank you. And Paul Schmidt, we let's go back to the voters because this is what the European Union is about. After all, it's about people. Uh, and when we talk about Euroscepticism, it's, it's the people we are talking about. So uh, State Secretary Korczuk mentioned that there was still popular support for, uh, for the European Union. And we also hear uh, from... Polish leaders that, you know, when there are th all these conflicts with Brussels that, that you know, at the end of the day, around 80% or so of, of Polish voters are, uh, want to stay within the European Union and are pro-European. What does that mean? Is that support really strong? Or what, you know, uh, once you ask concrete questions to People, do they really feel European or do they just, you know, what, what is it they like in, what, what is it exactly the support uh, in the European Union? Uh, well, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm not a politician, but I would like, before I answer your question, sure, I would sure. like to say something else. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and, and this is a free country. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. That's how they do it. <laughs> he, he, he's talking it. like a politician. Exactly. Isn't he? Yes. That's an old that's trick from the politicians. That's an yeah. old trick, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but when I, if I would answer your question yeah. now, I wouldn't have no, enough No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say that um, on the convergence issue, mm -hmm. uh, a question which you asked in the beginning, I think convergence just takes time. And uh, that's also what, uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Sefcovich pointed out, in fact. I mean, the important thing is to keep going, the path. Uh, uh, convergence is not a, a, a line which you walk on, uh, which always goes into one direction. Uh, you also have your up and downs. And uh, we're not talking about uh, or today that we're in uh, Slovakia, about uh, 14 years of EU membership, it just takes time with all the ups and downs which w all the EU countries have 
have experienced, and, and we have this tendency uh, to use uh, uh, the expression of crisis all the time. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I if we keep talking about crisis, maybe maybe our our own existence be own existence becomes a crisis, mm -hmm. and then we start to discuss Euroscepticism. It's important to discuss everything, but I think this Euroscepticism, in fact, is is not what we are confronted with. If you look at the data, because that's also what the State Secretary said before, there is support for EU membership, and the support is very high. This is not the issue. The issue is um, uh, what about uh, and criticism is, is is very important, okay? But it has to be based on facts, and and if and but but if we experience a a, a national populistic rhetoric, uh, which I, which is nothing that is that is only an issue of one country or the other countries, something which we see to different degrees in many EU countries. Mm -hmm. This, this is the real, the real issue which we have to talk about. Um, how do, do, even if we have this uh, um, scapegoating of, of the EU, which, which has to be, it has to be the EU's fault all the time because it's, it's us against them, which is complete nonsense. Um, and that works in any country. Yeah. It, it works, yeah. but only to a certain extent mm -hmm. because there's this insurance called EU membership. I would say, um, and 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 uh, I I also don't think that th that there were only uh, four years of happiness uh, after after the EU membership. <laughs> I'm not so Slovak, but uh, but I can s tell you for the Austrians that after '95 uh, we had many years of happiness, which didn't have much to do with mm. with the crisis that the media would actually inflate. Anyway, what what you what you asked me on 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 so I would rather believe the issue is is the way governments and some politicians actually deal with EU issues, and and the the na national responsibility, which is also a, a European responsibility. Um, um, there's there is support for for EU membership. That's clear. But then, of course, what, what does EU membership mean for, for, for many people? And it means different things. I mean, you have many people who would say, well, we, we're actually in this for economic benefit. Then you have other people that would say, well, European values is, is the most, most uh, important priority uh, for us. Um, the perception is, 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 is very different depending, well, on your political affili affiliation, but, uh, but also on the, the country which, which you were born. Uh, or where you live in, or where you work, where you work. So um, there are many, many features to this to this support. Um, but one one way to to measure uh, this support is also the turnout at European elections. Um, no? Yes and no. Yes and no. The because turnout. I understand it's very low here. Turnout yeah. th th of the European elections is quite a challenge. That's something. That's a question I would that I would le leave to to <laughs> my <laughs> Slovak <laughs> colleagues. I would say. <laughs> yeah. um, it de it depends a little bit on uh, how much do you actually know about the European Parliament? What is the role of the European Parliament? What can it actually change? What can it achieve? How much European discourse do you al actually have in in your in your countries? Um, that's, I think, a, a, a very fine initiative by my Macron. Uh, but Citizens Dialogue, we know that there have been many, many hundreds of them already organized by the European Commission. But anyway, it's different if a national government be stands behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think Slovakia also had very good experience uh, with this already, and, and Austria is lacking a little bit behind on this. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but but the mm -hmm. turnout is, is something where that we have to look at. Don't I, I don't want to put it under. No, so <laughs> State Secretary Kolchak is ready I will to, hand address, the question over to, to you. address <laughs> this issue since we're talking about national governments yes, yes. and uh, and we have an election next year, right. a European election next year. So, so the question is on the turnout in Slovakia. Well, I, uh, or <laughs> in <European laughs> I think elections. it was Just thirteen sure. percent no, no, uh, fine, last, fine. Uh, yeah, last yeah, election, accounted. and it was among the lowest in in the European Union. Well so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul has said he's not politician, but I think you have shown very clearly how politicians are speaking. You immediately moved, <laughs> you know, sort of very tricky question to me, but um, 
I'm not a politician, but I'm, I, I, no, I'm but ready you, to accept. But no you, know the ter you know the turnout of the European uh, Parliament elections in Austria, which are not, e no, not, not good either, but, yeah. uh, but still a little higher than in Slovakia. Yeah. I have to yeah. say yeah. this here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I got it. Okay, I, I got but, how, but how does this go together that, that you have a very high support for EU membership on the one hand yeah. and a very low turnout at the which European right. election? Like what does it mean for next year? Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, the can you imagine that this question came up during our meeting with Macron? Really? Yes. Did he know the turnout of Slovakia? Yes. yes because but, but we because didn't tell him, it wasn't us. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes, and you know, I, I liked very much the answer. I, I, I like very much the answer of our Prime Minister, who said, well, uh, look, the turnout is very low, but, parties, but the support for, for membership is very high. Imagine if it were the other yeah. way around. <laughs> if we had 70% participation. I don't know if that's very realistic. <laughs> no. but, but I would not underestimate in this very negative and low figure as regards the participation. Uh, I would not underestimate the fact that there is the solid support. My personal, mm -hmm. my very, very personal explanation why there is such a low turnout in Slovakia I think this shows that people see no urgency to go and vote. Mm -hmm. they, for them to vote for somebody who is then acting somewhere in Brussels and unless having clarity what kind of role they have there and, and of course I, because I'm traveling around uh, in, in Slovakia with our national convention and people People, I try to mobilize a little yeah. bit, and, ha and they say, well, why should I go and vote for 13 Slovak MPs out of 750, or how many they are? And this is, this is, not, this is not very easy, but the, the most important uh, role for politicians and all who, who are interested in, in increasing it is to make clear that it matters a lot what is happening uh, in European Parliament, the fact that currently you cannot adopt in 95, 96% of cases legislation without European Parliament because there is a uh, co-decision, and the fact that what they approve there becomes a law in, in, in Slovakia. But emotionally, I think that the most important moment is people do not sense any urgency. Why should I? go there and vote, they cannot identify, you know? Yeah. And then, my critical point, I keep on uh, angering uh, people in, in European Parliament. The problem is that European Parliament is not a European Parliament. It, it's not a Parliament in a, in a sense of the word. Mm -hmm. uh, because th there, are, uh, <laughs> there are a few issues. For example, you vote for a candidate and you vote for him on a party list mm -hmm. and for a program mm -hmm. which this party represents. But strangely enough, at the moment when he or, or she becomes member of a parliament, he or she, European parliament, he or she is committed to working within a party, yeah. uh, party family mm -hmm. which in many, many cases, when it comes to important issues, has a completely different, different position, That's you know, as the yeah, European yeah. socialists mm -hmm. have very much different positions on many of those who have been elected for Slovak Social Democrats mm -hmm. and European uh, EPP and so on. And so, so there is, there are these these issues which, mm -hmm. once again, in a, in a complex yeah. outcome, make it difficult for Slovaks to go and to be at least what, yeah. Maros, 25 percent. If we were 25, that would be al al already we double. We that yeah. we'll be corking a lot of uh, bottles of champagne yeah. because because yeah. I was I was running in this last uh -huh. uh, European Parliament elections for me it was the first uh, experience with being on the on the, on the list uh, uh, being on the ticket and and uh, uh, and going through the campaign mm -hmm. and I have to say that it was very humbling experience which I would sincerely recommend to all directors general in the Commission <laughs> because they would learn a lot what was my first lesson first uh, you realize that when you when you come home 
after this intense work in Brussels in, in whatever position, at first you have a problem to express yourself clearly in your own language because we are all using this EU speak, yeah. we are talking in these uh, two, three languages, we are mixing up the words. And simply when I came to Eastern Slovakia and, and, uh, and the very nice old lady asked me, so okay, so what are you doing? I was starting to explain to her she was looking at me <laughs> with <laughs> very big eyes, and then I realized, my God, there is no chance she could, she could understand me. So it took me like a couple of days to kind of uh, clean up my, my, my Slovak, and then, and, then, and then I realized yeah. that they don't understand me either. In Slovak. In Slovak. This time I was very precise and careful because simply our language is complex. Our policies are... are, are um, uh, very, very complicated, and and simply we just have to learn how to bring, I would say, these European issues down to the local level. What it means for this concrete uh, grandma uh, in Stropkov or, or for the students of, of, of Bratislava to be the member of the EU, and how can you explain what you do, how you contribute, how how, how concretely they can engage the, in uh, in this discussion, and 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 the and the last point in this, I would say. We, we need in these uh, two enormous, uh, I would say, assets on our side. And these assets would be the media. I don't want to say that they have to say that we are the best people in the world, but to be fair to Europe. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you that uh, the campaign was, um, I think, what was it, eight or ten weeks? I mean, uh, we, had, we had two topics uh, to which I answered, I, I don't know, 200 times, salaries and vacuum cleaners. Why vacuum cleaners? Vacuum cleaners, because at that time there have been oh new yeah. standards or vacuum cleaners and all the ladies been worried that I am taking the powerful vacuum cleaner <laughs> and they would have to vacuum one hour longer. And, 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 and that was really, I mean, the topic yeah. I was answering all the time. And, and then the, uh, the, the second, I would so say... I hope you solved the issue. Of yeah, the we, I mean, I, I was under the... And when I came home and my younger daughter told <laughs> me that, and don't touch my hair dryer, <laughs> so then I know that I... <laughs> that I'm really in trouble. And, <laughs> and, and then the second uh, very important... Uh, he knows my daughter, so... <laughs> <laughs> the, and the second very important uh, asset is we need uh, the, the support uh, of national politicians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if I will be, you know, uh, presenting you the, 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 the best story, how important it is, how crucial this is for our country, and then you would have, uh, like, uh, the wall of national uh, politicians contradicting you or permanently looking for some kind of micro-battles, micro-victories uh, uh, with Brussels, or even just being silent and not to, part uh, to participate actively in, uh, in, in the European campaign, then also... The um, the people would think that it's not important because there is no way how you can somehow talk over the heads of the national leaders, national politicians. They always would have a bigger exposure to the media. They always are bigger magnets yeah. uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the local population than if somebody comes uh, from, uh, from Brussels, uh, even as frequently as possible. So these are, I would say, a few things. We have to learn how to talk to our people, how to present the things in, in a normal way understandable way, but we need also support of the fair media and local politicians. Mm -hmm. um, I know Paul wants to jump in, but as a follow-up to this question, I would like to ask you, do you expect anything from those uh, citizens' dialogues, the consultation citoyenne that Macron had, has asked, uh, uh, I mean, has suggested uh, member states to, to carry? We've done them in front. We've started in France already. No, I, mm -hmm. I, I, th yeah. I think it's a, it's a very good idea, and it, it somehow blends in to what Maurice just said. Um, citizens' dialogues have been there for some years now, um, started by the European Commission and by the European Parliament, to be fair, and, and there's a lot of discourse going out, but you need the ownership of the national politicians. Mm -hmm. And that's where the merit of Macron comes in, because he pushes his colleagues into doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Austria is in case in point there. Um, and so, so does Chancellor Kurz uh, conduct citizens' dialogue? Not no. yet, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that, that, that the French embassy is a big motivator. <laughs> 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 and, and we have the council presidency coming up, so yeah. I, as I imagine there will be something going on. Um, but, but, but I know that, I mean, take Ireland, for example, mm -hmm. who's a country w yeah. where they have a lot of citizens' dialogue. Anyway, you need the commitment 
and the personal commitment and the ownership of your national politicians, be it for the national discourses or on the campaign, I totally agree with you. And there's a one point which I don't agree with you, I have to say. I mean, um, we have the same challenges in all the countries, be them about uh, explaining how uh, we, we do not uh, prohibit vacuum cleaners or we do not change hair dry dryers, the language challenge. We are, I mean, we do have this, these challenges in other countries as well, but, but still uh, the turnout is higher. Mm -hmm. So there must be something else there as well. I no? uh, here I, I would uh, agree with that an analysis of uh, Ivan that we be not able to transmit the message uh, why these uh, 13 MEPs are, are important uh, uh, for us and how it is important uh, to send well-qualified uh, professional people uh, who would proudly represent uh, your country and, and that you would be proud how they represent uh, you know, the citizens of, of Slovakia, that uh, they are kind of ambassadors of your country in this very important uh, European institution. And that I think we didn't manage to deliver because this perception, Ivan so well described, 13 out of 751 is not that easy uh, to uh, to overcome. So that's uh, that's really that's really a challenge. Uh, and I I want to reciprocate and agree with the vice president that it is impossible unless you have national ownership and, as you said, national magnets that show yeah. up uh, during the campaign because c people can identify it much. It's much easier to identify the guy who is one day talking about social issues in Slovakia and the other day he is showing up in Košice or somewhere in, in middle Slovakia and he says but look that social you know kind of stuff that we are dealing with here it does matter also within the European Union it, it, the, the social dimension for example and you can go area by area how you can explain to people that there is this connection but without uh, national uh, representatives who are committed who are reaching out impossible and Sylvie, what came to my mind while Vice President Paul spoke, um, how, how to mobilize. In fact, in Slovakia, I think we should, we should uh, turn off the EU for one week. <laughs> Just to let it disappear. Because, you know, I have two sons. Maris has uh, three <laughs> kids, two wonderful girls and one son. But when I speak to them, and they're absolutely pro-European, it's not that they would be yeah. anti but uh, when I try to explain to them, Eurozone, you can travel, they're both studying in Munich. Mm. And I said, all right, so what? So what? <laughs> when, I, when I try to explain to them that their father, just 25 or 30 years ago, had to queue on the, on the border here, just 10 kilometers from here, in order to get to Heinburg, mm. they don't understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to create out of this mm. a story where people will just raise and stand up and go on a Sunday or, or Saturday mm -hmm. uh, during the, the sunny, uh, sunny weekend and vote is difficult. Yeah. But I agree with Paul, there must be something more uh, behind that. Because in the Western European countries, uh, th there are similarly those problems. But I think we, you know, just 25 or how many years ago, you know, we were not a free country. No, okay. It requires... I have experienced, Maros have experienced the previous regime before 1989, but I think the, the next generation will be more active, proactive in, in domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And last point, my experience with citizens' consultations, <laughs> I, I say something uh, maybe not politically correct. In this country we have started them. You know when? When the first European Convention in mm -hmm. 2002 uh, and 2003 mm -hmm. started? Now we continue with that, but I'm so impressed that, that there are so many people in the audience Absolutely. here. Normally to get that many people somewhere uh, in the evening, yeah. in the middle of a week, in Banska Bystrica, impossible. Therefore, during the convention, our convention, public consultation, we are cooperating with the universities. Just on Tuesday, I was in middle Slovakia, 250 students, a very vivid discussion. And I, I, I think we, we have to speak to young generation because they can multiply the message. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, and I um, did quite, uh, quite uh, uh, a few citizens' dialogue. I, I think I did uh, three in France. Mm -hmm. 
I was sweating a lot because I did it in French, oh, so I was well practicing done. my passe composé and I'm parfait <laughs> and being <laughs> super nervous about subjunctif. <laughs> uh, I learned like two or three to impress the audience that I know that there is such a, there German is such a, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, the, the reason why I think in France uh, it was successful because the f of course you have to invest a lot in, um, in, in uh, preparation and we, o we always worked with the mayor and the uh, uh, first one, which was actually not an easy territory, Haute de France, you know what I'm talking oh about, yeah, yeah. stronghold of uh, Marie, Marie Le Pen. Yes, yeah. And there we had... Uh, That's uh, very courageous. Uh, we, uh, we, 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 we had a debate and um, um, I was uh, linked uh, through video link with uh, Ségolène Royal for a half an hour, uh, then uh, with, the, with the mayor. Uh, from from the city and of course you I have to say that you have to prepare well because you can be sure that within like 20 minutes you are from the European topics down to the local vacuum politics vacuum cleaner vacuum clean <laughs> but not even that stay date for port of Dunkirk yeah. or some kind of uh, camembert, uh, uh, camembert yeah. or or, uh, or uh, some kind of uh, decision uh, which was perceived as, as very uh, very very negative on 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 the, on the local business you simply have to know it but. My lesson after all this is that it's really enormous effort, but I think with one exception, usually the atmosphere in a room, which is a little bit tense at the beginning, kind of relaxes, and after this one hour, one hour, one hour and a half of the discussion, uh, you feel that a lot of things been cleared up and that atmosphere actually improved. Mm -hmm. The question is how to how to amplify it, because of course you cannot do it every day, the people would uh, not be interested. And I think that uh, a bit better cooperation with the, with the media, national, local, we have to still learn how to uh, make it more attractive to the social media, mm -hmm. so it would be a bit more attractive uh, for the people how to divide it in some kind of short messages so that uh, our YouTube generation, which yeah. has a, uh, the attention span of three minutes, I think that would, would be interested in, 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 yeah. in, the, in the key key messages that's I think what uh, what we have to what we have to learn so I saw the dialogue that Ivan was organizing in Gilles and I, the university and I have to say I was quite impressed because it was full there was a lot of people mm -hmm. and I know that that the prepara preparation it's very important and and then I would say benefiting from from the discussion that if you can plant the positive European seed in the mind of the young people I think it's worth it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I yeah just go ahead mm -hmm. in that discussion where in those discussions where I agree it is difficult for us to formulate the message to sell European Union there are some colleagues who were with me there but you know I came really impressed f from that because on a podium there, there are young people sitting with me and to my surprise you know what they're saying for them the economic benefit of European Union is important but many say that in their view, it is a peace project. Mm -hmm. Young people in Central Slovakia, in Eastern Slovakia, while I'm trying to explain roaming charges eliminated <laughs> and data transfer and everything, what Slovak presidency has achieved, and then they say, oh, the state secretary, but for us, this is about peace. And if a, if a young master student uh, of a uni technical universities in Kosice says that, then I think we should not mm -hmm. that be, be that skeptical. Not Eurosceptical, but not skeptical. That's interesting. Just yes, one oh small yeah. point, if, mm -hmm. I, if I may mm -hmm. add. I mean, communication is crucial and very important, but it's not the only thing. I think, um, I mean, uh, there are also uh, European decisions where segments of the society would not agree to. I mean, um, there is criticism which is uh, healthy, healthy, which is uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. um, there is a political debate on on maybe we need we just need more politics, but not these kind of politics where I I, I fight against the next headline, but but where it is about finding solutions and there are different ways of doing so. Maybe it's about more inclusiveness in the decisions and in the political strategies that we have. I mean, this social dimension is, is very, very much um, criticized by some and promoted by others. But, but there, are, there are many people who think that this is an important issue we should discuss. Mm -hmm. 
just to give you one example, uh, and there are, there are many many other examples. Maybe it's 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 about this. Uh, there are many people who feel left out, um, and 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 we we should go and 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 not only talk to them, mm -hmm. but but put their issues on the agenda. Yeah, but that you you're touching a very important and sensitive uh, subject because we. Um, the social problems of uh, our citizens are not dealt with in the same way I in the West and in Central Europe. And indeed, I understand there is a, a feeling of double standards here. Um, that, in fact, the European Union uh, is protecting the richer countries. And uh, now that uh, these uh, uh, Central European countries, which are starting to cut, which have caught up, and are starting to compete, uh, are not allowed to compete. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, if I understand what I hear in this part of Europe, it's uh, are subjected to a double, studded, a double standards and don't have the same uh, conditions that the Western uh, European countries or companies have. Is that, so since we have these, your uh, uh, national represent the national government and you represent the commission uh, what is your view of this issue of double standards and I'm not even mentioning the Nutella syndrome <laughs> Nutella, case. Nutella yeah. case which is interesting <laughs> because I don't know whether it's true or not but it's revealing right mm -hmm. well actually I'm, I'm I'm very grateful that that you are touching up on this um, because it's true I, I think when there is a good reason for our people to have an impression that there is a sometimes there is a second class uh, you know opposition for us and that we are not treated equally and not to be very general on this i can give you a few examples which maybe in the west mm -hmm. are non issues but those minor issues there are becoming bigger issues here number 1 um in this country after Brexit, it became clear that uh, some agencies will have to be moved from the United Kingdom somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So Slovaks have discovered that we are the best in providing competitive uh, you know, premises for the medicine agency. So we started the battle because there was an established criterion that the decision will take into account the fact of those countries where there is no agency mm -hmm. at this moment. Mm -hmm. And we believed in that. And the, the political representatives started to develop a positive narrative because we naively believed... You have no European agency no, in, in no, Slovakia. Mm -hmm. No. And, and th there is this political dimension because everyone here in this country started to mobilize, you know, and, and started to believe, yes, there is this criterion, we are one of the five, and logically, there can't be any other decision but to place it somewhere where there is none. <coughs> At the end of the day, Amsterdam got another one. How can, you know, how and can don't, you... Don't forget about Paris. Oh, well. <laughs> we have Sylvie here. Who has already, so who has already <laughs> some... <laughs> we casted a vote for, <laughs> for that one. Uh, but we got one for <laughs> in exchange. Number two, uh, not to go that far indexation of child benefits. Mm. <laughs> Last week we had a fantastic lunch with Sebastian Kurz. Great. <laughs> uh, and in, in, the, in the press conference the Slovak Prime Minister is confronted with the question how come that Slovaks who are contributing uh, to the Austrian uh, social system will get, re will receive back from that system for those people who work legally, mm -hmm. just a fraction mm -hmm. of child, child benefits. How can you explain that? So my, my humble response was then, let's index also our contributions. Mm -hmm. Number three, um, you still, we, we, still, um, we still feel that in, in the Western part of Europe, and I can understand it partly, there is a there is a feeling that you are transferring money for cohesion funds and therefore we have to follow. And if a problematic issue comes up, like with migration, and all of a sudden we have our opinion, then we are anti-Europeans. Because the impression is mm -hmm. 
well, <laughs> we are sending, we are transferring money, we are building infrastructure here, as if it would not be in the interest of Western European firms who are profiting 85, uh, 85 cents out of one euro, it is calculated, is coming back for, from the cohesion, cohesion funds. So yes, uh, my answer is that there are um, moments where people in new member states do not have a feeling that they are, that they are equally uh, treated. We, we are not misusing that in Slovakia. I think we are not the ones who would immediately blame everybody uh, for this. But this is, uh, this is very difficult uh, to explain mm -hmm. from time to time. So Maybe just put on such your commission hat. Uh, yeah, an anecdotal evidence on, on, on the double standards and uh, Nutella and even more importantly, detergent mm -hmm. and others, uh, you know, uh, products. He's, he's very much into it's cleaning. It yeah, 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 you know, I have, I have uh, uh, three girls at home and... Uh, <laughs> And my wife, li uh, my, my mom uh, lives here and, and she very much liked to go uh, shopping to Hamburg because she was telling us for years, detergent is better, <laughs> Nutella is better. We didn't believe her until, until we got the results that it's actually true. And, uh, and, and when I was, for the first time, and I have to say that it was something like two years ago, when the first time uh, we raised this issue, I can tell you that, uh, uh, that the commissioners are ni nice people and we are really like one family, we are good friends, but when I was explaining to them, they look at me in disbelief, they couldn't believe that you could have the same package and totally different quality. They couldn't believe, they thought that I'm inventing, and then we got all that stories from the, uh, from, uh, from the, uh, from, uh, from the commercial chains, that this is local tastes and flavors and all this uh, nonsense. So uh, it took us really, I would say, one and a half year, a bit of a crisis, uh, uh, um, to which really get off the, the chairs, the citizens in, in all new member states, that people listen to us. It's true, just here you have scientific evidence, just measure it and do something with that. And now I'm glad that we found the solution, that uh, there, is, there are the new rules and, it would, uh, and, and I'm sure that it would be much better. And, and, uh, and uh, if we are talking about butter fingers, they actually would be butter also in Eastern Europe. And when we're talking about detergent, actually will be detergent substances also in, in, in the powders here. But a little bit different subject, which would be very much on the table uh, right now. And, uh, and uh, I go through right now quite a challenging process of setting up the, the framework for the next multi-annual financial perspective, which is next seven years budget. As you, as you know, we adopted That's the- another fantastic- uh, It is. MFF. Right? MFF, yeah. multi-annual financial perspective, seven years budget of the, of the, of the EU. I mean, it's actually, it's a lot of money. Uh, the proposal we put on the table, it's 1,135 billion euros, so it, it's a lot of money. Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, everybody agrees with the new priorities, new structure, but I think we will have very difficult uh, debate uh, concerning the allocation criteria and uh, uh, how much money actually should continue to be coming uh, to, the, uh, to the new member states. And what is the reason? The reason is that, uh, of course, the situation changed and, um, and uh, there is very strong argument that our country has been doing extremely well. We've been growing, our living standards have been going up, uh, unemployment is down. We, we are very lucky in, uh, in most of the new member states that our pupils finish the secondary school, so we have very, very little uh, uh, dropout uh, rate. So I would say the criteria, which been very important, like I would say seven or eight years ago, has changed. So the natural reaction of my colleagues from Western Europe is, yeah, you are doing so well, so you have to understand that you would get less. And I said, I, I understand it, but what would be the reasonable proportion? And you know why? because the pension of my mother is 450 euros, because the average salary in Slovakia is still below 1,000 euros, so we are officially all under the poverty level of Germany. So we cannot pretend that actually we are richer than uh, some countries in Southern Europe, that some G20, G7, uh, G7 countries, even though we, we, we did well. And I think it, uh, it's uh, very sensitive, and I'm very glad uh, that the president of the commission, the budget uh, commissioner, they got it, and we are actually looking for the way, because everyone accepts that, of course, uh, UK is leaving, there will be less money, we have new priorities, everybody accepts that. But what is the most important we have to achieve in this budget talk? This is the fairness, that if you look at it, you say, yeah, it's fair. I mean, we have less money, we have new priorities, this is fair. 
And that's, I think, what is not that it's easy to say, but if you have to put it in mathematical formula, that's get much more complicated, and this is what we are looking for. So these two topics just show that we, I mean, new old member state, east, west, north, south, we just need to talk to each other more. We need to understand each other more. We have to be genuinely interested uh, in our situations because in that case, uh, it would be much easier to adopt the fair solution for the whole European Union. Um, you mentioned moving to another subject, uh, oops, still within Europe. Uh, you mentioned the previous regime and Czechoslovakia and the communist regime. Um, something we've heard uh, from, not from this country, but from Hungary and Poland, which shocked us a lot in the West, was that these diktats from Brussels are like from we used to have them from Moscow, we don't want them from Brussels. Is this something you can understand or explain? Is the, uh, uh, you know, I'm going at, uh, I'm asking this because is there um, something in the communist past of the countries of this region which could also explain uh, some degree of Euroscepticism? I should be diplomatic with, uh, no, no, with no, my no, answer. No, 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 don't be diplomatic. No. Well, I should be. <laughs> so therefore, my clear answer is no. Mm -hmm. I don't share it. Mm. I don't share the constant complaint uh, about Brussels and, and depicting and portraying it as a, as a dictate. Of course, we, you know, from time to time, uh, it's not very easy to explain the decisions or proposals by the Commission because this is so complex. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, Sylvie, you know, in, in my talks with students uh, across Slovakia, the, the first, one of the first agreed questions with the spontaneous <laughs> question, questions by the moderator, which is with us, is whether we believe that there is a Brussels dictator. Uh, do, do you know what, what is my answer? No. It's a fair answer because I believe in it. Because what we see from Brussels is just the implementation of the rules we member states have agreed on. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I could go into very difficult uh, legal explanations, but as a basis, the Commission is proposing and the Parliament and member states are adopting. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's, it's up to 95% the implementation of what we have agreed. Number two, I am trying to explain, uh, to explain to our people, if there had not been dictated by Brussels, you know, how could we deal with the giants like Google who are m mm. misusing their position on the markets? Or, and you can, how could we deal with difficult issues of state aid? Where Brussels, in, in fact, thanks to Brussels' dictate, he, we are protected. Could Slovakia deal with Google? Could Slovakia compete with Germany when it comes to state aid, could we get Jaguar Land Rover if there would be no state aid rules? They would pay for it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't have that money. Could we eliminate roaming charges? If Slovaks are spending two, three weeks in Croatia, thanks to Slovak presidency, of course, <laughs> <laughs> they're coming back and, and the parents are not shocked when they get their bills and they see, you know, that that they want 1,000 uh, euro uh, check because we have eliminated rooming. And I'm right, asking right. Slovaks, can you imagine <laughs> that Slovakia could in a way individually force the telecommunication you know, companies to eliminate their profit? Mm -hmm. Data transfer. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it is dictated because they strictly implement and we can complain what we, ha what we agreed. Mm -hmm. And two, this dictate in many cases protects us. And I know if, 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 uh, if somebody else would be here who is opposed against Brussels, they would say that I am Euro free and, that, and yeah. I'm too, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, too uh, optimistic on all that. But if you look at the big picture, I think <laughs> for smaller mm -hmm. states like Slovakia, like Austria and others, <laughs> the only way how to deal with the big ones is, is yeah. to be protected by rules That's cool. and, and yeah. bigger ones. Mm -hmm are giving up much bigger portion of sovereignty. I mean, if German foreign ministers are stop, Sigmar Gabler says that for Germany, European integrations, integration means how to regain sovereignty, then I think we should be quite quiet mm -hmm. as, as a small nation. But Sylvie, somebody yeah. will give you that question about Sweden, you can send them to me, yeah. because I studied there. 
And I studied there during Perestroika, which was a very democratic yeah. period of the Soviet Union. And I can assure you that there were no ministers from Warsaw but coming for, you know, yeah, ministerial right. councils yeah, yeah. and <laughs> negotiating how the things would be done. <laughs> so, I mean, only people yeah. who had no imagination how it mm -hmm. was before, what was our position mm -hmm. at that time, can compare it to Brussels. I mean, we both with... Uh, with Ivan, we've been uh, uh, sitting in uh, in, in Koreper, and I think we, we would be the best of... Uh, not at the same time. Uh, not at the same time. <laughs> but uh, I think both of us, we spent more hours uh, negotiating uh, with our friends than we spent at home with our, with our uh, <laughs> families. And you know why? Because we wanted to arrive at consensus. And I think in more than 90%, uh, we managed to, we managed, uh, to do that. And, uh, and, and really, I mean, uh, in that table, um, in the end, uh, we are spending two or three or four hours more because we are looking for the solutions for Malta, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for Cyprus, or for specific mm -hmm. specific issues of the of the northern or mm -hmm. southern um, uh, member states, and and that's the primary drive that you want to mm -hmm. arrive at at consensus. Not always it's possible; sometimes it's impossible. But uh, more than ninety percent, we we arrive to do that, and and this is, I think, what uh, uh, I. Um, why I regret uh, what I call this elevator syndrome very often, that uh, you have a unanimous decision, especially the Eurozone is the case, yeah, and it was, yeah, uh, I yeah. mean, during the economic crisis, it was so telling, that it was difficult. It was difficult for everyone, but you arrived at the consensus. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a decision. And then I would say for, for many ministers, it was very appealing to kind of go through this uh, elevator cycle and once you arrived in front of the journalists on the, on the, on the ground floor, we said, they decided it, <laughs> it happened. Yes, yeah. And this is confusing the people yeah. because not yeah. many of them was courageous enough to say, yes, I support it because yeah. I believe it was yeah. a good decision. Yeah. And, and I know yeah. that maybe it would uh, represent uh, 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 certain difficulties, but that was the best we could do mm -hmm. this evening. And I believe in that decision and uh, this would be best for Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think what uh, we would still need uh, to develop because otherwise we are, we are confusing the people. Mm -hmm. that Who are the men in black, somewhere yeah. in background, who are actually pulling the strings and taking yeah. the well decision so on our behalf? I think there are two things again. there. The, the question of, of, of commitment. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no decision taken where, where member states don't sit on the table. And, and the second thing is the confusion on the distribution of competences. Who is in charge of what? Uh, is it is it EU against us? No, because we are, are the EU and we sit at the table and take the decisions. We decide who is in charge of what, uh, in fact, and we, we also decide that in, 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 in trade relations, it's, it's the European Commission, for example, in charge mm -hmm. to negotiate for us trade agreements, which, which then have to be, a mandate is given, uh, negotiation is done, and then you, ne you need the, the ratification. So you need to be clear on, on, on the distribution of company, but, but it is, I admit it is, it is very confusing. Mm -hmm. It is very confusing who is in charge of what, and then you have people yeah. saying, uh, well, don't promise too much uh, if you cannot keep your promises. Mm -hmm. That's something that I heard mm -hmm. on, on uh, European Day, 9th of May in Austria. Mm -hmm. The European Union shouldn't promise too much if it cannot keep it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we talk about, I admit that the EU budget for seven years is quite a substantial amount of money, but it's, you know that better than I do, it, it, it's, it's not a lot of money mm -hmm. if you look at more than 500, 500, five million, 500 people. million people, right, yeah. and it's 1% of, of mm -hmm. EU GDP. Mm -hmm. And then you say people um, uh, talk about uh, net contributions and, ne uh, and net receipts, and and we we have we, ha we have to we, ha we will have one member less, so we, we want to contribute less to the EU budget. But how can a European Union actually keep promises? Give them, give us the tools actually mm -hmm. to be able to fulfill on those promises. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a beautiful Sunday morning where you give a beautiful speech on things that should be done but can never be done and can never be delivered on. So we have to be very realistic on this. Cannot uh, promise promise heaven and, and, and don't have the tools to do it. Uh, thank you. I'm a terrible moderator because I find this conversation so fascinating that I forgot to ask you for your questions. And, uh, it's because <laughs> we can't about see you very well. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But talking about the people, which is, I just forgot the people. I'm very sorry. Um, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
the, the French way. So please uh, go here. We have a question. Maybe we'll take two or three, and then and he another one here, and another one here. Okay, so we have three. Good evening, Pavel Zerka, ICFR Paris. Uh, I'm a Paul living in France, uh, and I share a lot Dzień of <laughs> share a lot of things that uh, that I heard. A simple questions uh, question. Commissioner uh, Shevkovich mentioned uh, the just started negotiations or talks about uh, multi-annual financial framework after 2020. One of the um, criteria proposed by European Commission is the extent to which countries respect the European values. So my question to the panelists would be very simple. Uh, is it a good idea and why not? Very good question. I will take, we'll take uh, another one here. Yeah. And another one here and then we'll answer. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant John Jacobs, Royal Lands Armed Forces and the President of the Youth Atlantic Treaty Association. Um, here with my, uh, my lovely colleagues from the GILF program. Earlier today, we touched upon something that was touched upon by Ivan as well. This idea that when something happens in Europe, when it's good, it's the nationals who claim it. Um, so if you claim also the, the roaming charges, that's something that the Slovaks did. It's never Brussels who do the good things. But when it's bad, it's Brussels who was bad and mean and oh, it's, just, it's the Brussels dictatorship. Um, but we find ourselves seeing national politicians feeding the narrative all over Europe. How do we get rid of that? Because I think if we can fix that, we might be lovely on our way to restore the trust in both our national democracies as well as in Europe. Thank you. Okay, and we take the last one at the last row after this one, and then we only have seven minutes to answer. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry, hello everyone, uh, my name is Dominic Hatiar. Um, I'm also in the Global Young Leaders uh, Forum of GlobSec. Thanks so much for inviting us. Uh, just a very quick question on the turnout rates. So you really see very often that when, you, when communication is done about the EU in Slovakia, we're on the defensive, you know, talking about the values, we have the Schengen, and as you said, we take that already for granted. So what are the big ideas for the next parliamentary elections, European parliamentary elections, to politicize the debate a little bit more, just make it more sexy? And we were just today, um, uh, we, had a, we have a working group on sustainability ideas, and one of the ideas that, that we came forward with, and which really pertains to the, to the vacuum cleaners, um, is that uh, we just need to, these vacuum cleaners, my, my granny would always say, that the new ones break all the time. They don't last longer than two or three years, whereas her Soviet one lasted for 50, 50 years. Uh, and we, need, we actually, this yeah, is a problem. The nuclear power station to power it, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't clean anything. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, a, it's a problem for circular economy. So you need to, uh, we would love to see having guarantees from the EU, for instance, that the producers need to products, uh, produce products which last just longer. 10 years and have a guarantee on that. And that has such a direct impact on your daily life, for instance. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. I think 
Thank you very much. Okay, we have two minutes each, so we'll yeah. start with so you. So I'll, I'll take the, the, the rule of law and... If, and you, if you can increase the turnout, I will give you all my two minutes. <laughs> 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 I'd love to, I can tell you. But, but on, on I will just take the, the rule of law because it's a very specific question and, and the vision for the future. The, the rule of law, I think that um, uh, I have to say, uh, unfortunately, mostly because of the uh, situation in, in Poland and uh, the extremely difficult discussion we have uh, with the Polish uh, government on the justice uh, uh, reform, the debate which was some kind of lingering in, in, in the background of uh, the, the budget talks came really to the, to the forefront and, and the net contributors started to ask very urgently, very legitimate question. How can, he, how can we explain the huge transfer of the money uh, to the country which appears not to respect our set of values, which are kind of departing from the Copenhagen criteria to which we all sign up when we're joining the EU, where you do not know that you, you can actually execute proper judicial and uh, uh, audit controls on how this enormous uh, amount of uh, money is spent. And of course, if we uh, want uh, to have uh, the, the next budget, we simply have to clarify this issue. And therefore, we proposed uh, uh, this rule of law uh, mechanism. And I can tell you that uh, uh, I was extremely insistent upon one very important thing, that this would be a rule which would be horizontal, meaning applicable to all funds, not only to the cohesion funds, which are mostly spent in the new member states, and that we have to have a horizontal application um, of uh, this rule, meaning that any of the member states uh, could fall under this mechanism. Because today is Poland, tomorrow it could be some other country, and we just have to have the mechanism which makes sure that uh, if you do not have proper judicial control, if you're really departing from the values of the, of the EU, that uh, there will be a, a mechanism how, of course, uh, these uh, quite uh, significant transfers, uh, transfers of, of, of money uh, could be then, then stopped until uh, we find uh, the solution. So I'm, I'm sure that this would not be easy discussion. I know that uh, particularly the situation in Poland was the subject of the discussion of General Affairs uh, uh, Council and the ministers, I think, discussed it already the second or third, third time. And uh, it's, it's a political issue and uh, apparently the effort which has been done by the new Polish uh, government goes in the right direction, but we are not there yet. Still, there is not feeling that uh, uh, the, the judicial uh, system in Poland is, uh, I would say, as independent and it would work properly under all these new uh, changes which are introduced into the system. And on the vision, totally agree that we, we are very much on the defensive and, and I think that why these elections in the next year would be important? Uh, uh, because uh, the next commission actually would decide if I, I hope I'm not too melodramatic, a little bit of uh, fate of Europe in this century. Would it be Chinese century? Would it be American century? Or would it be European century? What kind of uh, technological development we can promote? What kind of technological independence we will be uh, able to demonstrate with all the changes we are introducing. And I believe that uh, we will have to look for much fairer solution in uh, the trade. Because uh, when I'm looking at the situation in China, when you talk to our companies there, they will tell you from one side, yeah, we have to be here because it's a very dynamic market. But from other side, we are under ter tremendous pressure to reveal our intellectual property right, to reveal our patents. We have to train local force. We have to have super high, high content. And if you are from Europe, you had very limited chance to be successful in the public procurement. Now you see what's happening in the United States, so I think that uh, we have to have a vision of Europe which can shape global affairs. We have to be much stronger economically, politically, militarily, and present this uh, uh, vision to the voters because the next decade, I think it would uh, very much uh, depend on what we as Europeans would do, how the turn of the century uh, would look like. Thank you very much. So Thank you very much. I think I'm told you have to go at eight, so you're uh, yes, excused. You yeah, and we, we okay. will just finish. <laughs> we started without you, so we'll finish without you if you have to go. So, so but in thank this case, you. I would really thank you very much for waiting for me and being such a good idea. And but thank you so and much. You're such a great thank moderator. You. Thank you. <laughs>
to. So, uh, State Secretary, you want to answer these uh, easy questions? Maybe I take uh, one of them and one comment, what Christine uh, from Alta uh, has said, I, I share it. I, uh, my respect that so many Maltese citizens find it important and they go and vote. I mean, maybe I, I understand you reminded us maybe of a difference between election law that we have because voting for the parties might be different from voting for individual persons and maybe through them we can make it more uh, more credible and more important for people to to go and vote, uh, but uh, I, I think it's up to politicians. Full, full stop for me. It's uh, it's not for diplomats. It's it's not for uh, for think tankers. Uh, it's for the for the politicians just to understand the responsibility mm -hmm. which they feel uh, if they believe that th they should get the legitimacy for European Union because at the end of the day, with the low turnout. Um, there is it's lacking or, or lack of legitimacy uh, afterwards. And second, um, calling here, I think you are you asked a very pertinent question. Why is it that that politicians, you know, very often, if I simplify, misuse, uh, you know, the European Union and all the successes are becoming national? Why the failures are are uh, European, or we blame Brussels for? Well. I think those who go down this path are mainly, in my view, uh, politicians who lack a real, real agenda back home. And the European Union offers, I think, a lot of things that can, they can easily sell and, and for which they can blame Brussels. I mean, I am experiencing that also in our uh, citizens' dialogue. The sometimes people remember more the, the bloody issue with cucumbers, you know, <laughs> than they remember the elimination of roaming. And I try to explain to them, you know, without regulation that so many people are complaining about, there would not be roaming uh, elimination. But pe people still remember those, um, <coughs> those strange examples that are remembered uh, mm -hmm. and that politicians, as I say, they, they better use them in order to reach out to people, because then, then the audience is clapping mm -hmm. when you complain about the European Union. Mm -hmm. But when you say That's that true. it protects us in the area of, of uh, state aid, state assistance, well, who cares about that? Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. I will wrap it up with my deep, deep conviction. It's a responsibility of, of politicians. Politician. And those, once again, who believe and who are able to identify a real agenda, they are, uh, they, they rarely uh, misuse Brussels, but those who have empty hands, hands they very often misuse uh, Brussels, mm -hmm. because otherwise they cannot reach out yeah. in a credible way to their own audience. And on the rule of law, the, the other question, is it a fundamental principle of the Euro okay. European Union? Absolutely. <laughs> and it Absolutely, has to be I, I, I say that uh, rule of law as such, and the principles of it, they're not negotiable. Mm -hmm. It's like a ten uh, gebote, I don't know how, do, how we say it in, uh, in English. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is fundamental, because it's like about the young people uh, who impressed me so much when I tried to sail, sell the European Union economically, and they remind me it's a peace project. And we must not forget to explain people that, you know, <laughs> Rule of law is not everything, but without it, everything is nothing, uh, I could say. Because, uh, you know, we, we are not explaining uh, enough to our people what our values are. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we forget uh, to explain to them what the West means, that this is not a geographical, you know, determination, but much more it is uh, about our values on which this project uh, was built on the ruins of, a, of, a most, uh, of the most uh, bloodiest uh, Second World War. If we forget that, then I think we go to bust. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paul, you will have the last word. For the last remaining 10 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> I will just take the opportunity to congratulate uh, Globsec for this wonderful event and for, for uh, having you all here. I think if we all stick together and you all take five of your friends and convince them to go to the next elections, then maybe 
turnout will already be increasing. 100%, 25%. 25 at least, at least. <laughs> at least. Yeah. I, I, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. You the, and the last I words think back you, you are the ones also to help uh, pushing big ideas, uh, the, the young people, big ideas for Europe, because we all need them from in the West and in, in Central Europe as well. Thank you very much for coming here and thank you very much for your <laughs> input. Thank you.